been torn down, everything that's been separated.
day that didn't have to die. Our Savior gave his life. Rejected by us all. In silence for the Redeem. 
you find a seat, if you can turn to someone, let them know you're glad to see them tonight. That'd be great. The first Good Friday we're celebrating here in our home. And yes, amen. And I'm very excited for Easter on Sunday, but we can't get to Easter until we walk through Good Friday. And it's my privilege to speak God's word to you tonight. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 27. And I'm going to read from verse 45 through 53. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and off, offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth, the earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection, and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. Lord, help us tonight as we study your word. We pray this in your name. Amen. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's probably one of the most heartbreaking things to hear from any child, let alone the Son of God. Because here on this cross, in this Harrowing moment is a son crying out to a daddy who no longer is there. Jesus is forsaken. Forsaken, not lost. Not lost accidentally. That's happened to me before. I've, my dad lost me. I don't know if my mom even knows this. But at a baseball game, Cubs game. Okay, so any, any, any other Cubs fans out there? I'm not sure if that's it. It's a heckle or a, an agreement there, but anyway, at a Cubs game, uh, it's a heckle, okay. At a Cubs game, um, just a thick crowd, and our hands got ripped apart and couldn't find my dad for a scary few minutes. And the fact I'm talking about this tells you how traumatizing that still that was, that memory of losing my father, even for a moment. But this is not Jesus losing his dad by accident. God doesn't accidentally, accidentally let go of Jesus' hand here. He's intentionally abandoned because Jesus says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Forsaken me. And this is not... Can we have the lights, actually? I've got to see your faces. It's too dark. I need the lights. Thank you. Yes! I can see my people. Thank you. Uh, he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He screams this. He screams this in agony, in pain. If you understand the Greek, this is not whispered. This is a guttural cry. And the question we need to ask tonight is on top of the humiliation, on top of the pain, on top of the obvious torture, why does God have to forsake his son? And then we call this Good Friday. So the message of my sermon is called The Cry. I want to first talk about the horror of the cry. The horror of the cry. Because the cry, I need to place it where it belongs. It's in the midst of Jesus dying. Jesus experiencing excruciating pain and utter humiliation. By this point, you saw some of the, the imagery here. He has been beaten spit upon, st struck over and over, a crown of thorns placed on his head, which was beaten into his brow. He's been whipped 
40 times, lacerated, almost filleted, whoa, until uh, his back is exposed, all the muscles in his back is exposed. Let me see if this will work. You know what? I'm just going to go freestyle. Freestyle it. It's not going to work. Uh, the, the muscles of his back exposed. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. And on top of that lacerated back, they place a cross he has to carry to his own death, where he's stripped naked and then nailed through his wrists and feet. And now he has to make a choice. Do I breathe or do I hurt? Because to breathe, when you're stretched out on a cross, you actually have to hoist yourself up so your diaphragm can, can, can inhale and exhale. And that, of course, means your back is being ripped on that wood and all the pressure on the nail of your feet and in the pressure points of your wrists. I mean, we're talking about excruciating pain. The Gospel of Mark says that pain began at 9 a.m. That's when the crucifixion began. And he died at 3 p.m. So six hours. Six hours of agonizing pain. Now, in the last three hours, so from 3 p.m. to 6, sorry, from 12 p.m. to 3 p.m., something cosmic happens. We just read this in our passage. The sky darkens. Why? Well, God has always presented himself as light. So darkness means his presence is being removed. And sure enough, as the sky grows dark, Jesus' suffering reaches a new pitch because even in the beginning, as he's dying, as he's suffering, the first few words out his mouth are rather encouraging. He says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And then he tells the thief next to him, why is he even thinking about the thief? I don't know. But he says, today you'll be with me in paradise. And then, and then he sees his mother, and he entrusts his mother to John. So he, he seems to be suffering pretty nobly the first couple hours. But the last couple hours, there's no more kind words to share. The sky has grown dark. He's hit rock bottom. And Jesus now screams, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the question is, what triggered that scream? Was it the unbearable physical pain? I don't think so, because his own men would suffer like him. Would our hero, the Messiah, not be able to suffer as much as even his own men? And he seemed to be doing fine the first few hours. I don't think it was the pain. Something else was happening. Something that would make Jesus shake and even express that my soul is troubled to the point of death at Gethsemane. And what is that? What is that agony that would trigger Jesus between 12 p.m. and 3 p.m.? To scream, Eloi, Eloi, Lema Sabakdani. It's the very thing that he screamed about. God had forsaken him. He reaches out, his spiritual antennas reach out, and he cannot find God. Now, I'm a human being, and I, my pain threshold is fairly high, I think. And I'm willing to hurt all the way to the end if I know that my loved ones still love me. If there's a hope of meeting my loved one again, perhaps I suffer to the very end. In fact, we've heard of stories, whether it be in the Holocaust or people taken captive, they will hold on if they know that those who love them are still there. They can still reach out and feel that love or just imagine them loving them back. But when that love is ripped away, when you can't feel the love of your family and you can never return to them, then you lose hope. It's the worst pain of all when you reach out and you cannot feel love. And that's for a human being. But what about someone divine who has known perfect love from this person, his father, 
not for 80 years or 90 years of our lifetime, but for eternity. He knew perfect love, perfect fellowship, perfect intimacy with his Father for a time span we can't even begin to imagine. And here in this unique moment, for the first time ever in all of eternal history and eternal present and eternal future, the Father and Son are separated where Jesus reaches out and he can't feel his dad. That's the horror that triggers Jesus. The moment it goes dark, the moment God leaves, Jesus screams in agony. The horror, the horror of the cross. Don't look to the body and the blood and the lacerations and the crown. Yes, that's bad. The true horror is that the son is forsaken. The reason for the cry. Why does the father forsake the son? It involves a cup. It's not as if Jesus' abandonment surprised Jesus. He signed up for it. Before the creation of the world, he signed up for it. He knew he had to save you. And at Gethsemane, he confirmed that plan. But it came at a great cost. Jesus was so troubled by the thought of drinking down this cup that he begged his father, if there's any way, let this cup pass. This cup is directly related to the cry. What is the cup? It says in Jeremiah 25 that there is a figurative cup, a metaphoric chalice, in which is stored up all the wrath of God towards all evil. God's collective wrath towards all of evil is held by this figurative cup, which is, it seems like a gruesome image, but that cup is a cup of mercy because he's delaying it. He's holding it. He's containing it so you don't have to drink it. Our God is a God of perfect justice. He has to be because he's perfectly good, perfectly holy. And so evil can never have the final word, which means every wrong must be addressed. My daughter recently my youngest one recently discovered Lion King. And in Lion King, there's an evil lion called Scar. Scar is murderous and evil, a fiend. Imagine if Scar took the throne and he wins. I think my daughter would shake violently and want to burn down Disney. The kids would protest. Because even in the child of a young, sorry, the heart of a young child is a sense of justice that Evil must not have the final word. And if any evil, big or small, is left unaddressed, unaccounted for, swept under the rug, that evil is potent enough to undo God's moral universe because God's perfect. So how can there be wrong unaddressed and have that wrong be the final word? And yet we know there's so much wrong that seems to be unaddressed. Just have to look across to Israel and Gaza and realize there are countless wrongs we cannot see, the UN will never see, no court will ever see, and it'll just get swept aside as we progress, as that becomes history, as the UN maybe one day will sanction, maybe not, maybe there'll be a treaty, maybe there'll some, be some reparations, we don't know, but who will account for every small evil faced by child, faced by a bereft widow, faced by an injustice slaughter, faced by captivity, torture, abduction. Who will pay for that? There is a God who sees it all. And there is a God who will account for every evil and every evildoer. And that evil runs through me. I need to account for all my evil. It might be exotic in headlines when it says Israel and Gaza, but the injustice, the selfishness, and the greed, and the lust, and the pride, and the vengeance runs through me too. And God, instead of deciding to destroy mankind, stores up all his just wrath in a cup. Because he holds it. He holds it so that we don't have to drink it. Who will? 
Jesus. And that's the cup that terrified Jesus. I don't want to drink this cup, Father. Please, I don't want to have to drink this cup because if I do, that means I will have to take on all the consequences of all the evil, all the guilt, and all the shame of all the people I love. So they don't have to drink it, I have to drink it. But that means I have to live out the consequences of all that evil, which is separation from God. And so, Jesus, in that, even, in that night at Gethsemane, he chooses his Father's will. And he agrees to drink down this cup out of his love for us. The Father and Son agrees to this bizarre plan for his Son to drink down the cup. What does that exactly mean? It means Jesus literally becomes our sin. Isaiah 53, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Christ, Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. He literally becomes the curse. God hangs our iniquities upon his son. You think the crown of thorns was perhaps just a strange, uh, you know, impromptu thing the Roman guards decided to mock Jesus with, but did you know that the symbol of the curse in Genesis were thorns? He's crowned with it, driven into his skull to say to the rest of us that in that moment, Jesus was becoming he was being crowned with our sin and our guilt and our shame. And he would become the curse. And he would take on all the penalty that all the evil, whether it be in Israel and Gaza or through your heart, is deserving. Now, that's a lot to take in. And so God was preparing his people all along for this cross moment. And that's why he instituted... Uh, animal sacrifices. If you read the Old Testament, you sin, you bring a sin offering, you butcher livestock uh, as atonement for your sins. And that animal sacrificial system culminated on a day called Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, where on the Day of Atonement, only one day a year, the high priest would go into a section of the temple called the Holy of Holies. And behind a curtain is where God's presence actually dwelt. If you came earlier, we actually had some fog machines pushing out fog, pushing out smoke. I thought I'd never see the day where we knew we'd have smoke machines, but we did. You had see like the clouds swirling. Now that's just fog. But behind this curtain was a place called the Holy of Holies, where God's glory cloud, his actual presence dwelt. And you could not enter in unless you were, you'd be killed. So only one time a year did God allow someone to come in. And that's the high priest on Yom Kippur. He would come through this curtain that was four inches thick, required an army of people to pull open. He'd walk in. He would offer a blood sacrifice on behalf of his people to atone for all their sins. And then to double down on the, on the meaning, uh, outside the temple, they'd bring a scapegoat. So after he offers the blood sacrifice in the Holy of Holies, he'd come out, they'd bring a scapegoat, a literal goat, where he would put his hands on the goat and then transfer all the sins of the people on the goat. And that goat would then be led outside the camp into the wilderness as, as a way of symbolizing how uh, the, the, the wrath and the condemnation all those sins deserve is being removed from his people. And that would happen every year. So that... The people of God would have muscle memory to remember that this is the way it works. Sin has to be transferred from the people to something else so that something else can pay the price. And all of that imagery was fulfilled on the cross. Yom Kippur was fulfilled on the cross. All our sins placed upon Jesus. Jesus drinking all of that cup of wrath that we deserve. And the final result is Jesus' abandonment. All our sin transferred onto Jesus. 
His blood for our blood. His death taking the place of our death. He becomes a scapegoat, absorbing all our sins and receiving the penalty we deserve, which makes Jesus cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If you want to call this Good Friday good, please know how horrible your sins are. Please don't come here thinking that you're a good person. If you're a good person, you don't need to be saved. If you're a good person, go figure it out. We come here because we're evil. Because I'm a sinner. My sins crushed Jesus. My sins killed Jesus. My sins deserve God's wrath. I'm supposed to go to hell. And Jesus took that. And it was so bad. Our sins were so bad. It made him almost want to die. He begged the Father, please, please take this cup from me. When he, when he screamed, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's not because he didn't understand what was happening. It was just so bad. It was so painful. Because he had to feel all your garbage. He had to feel all your shame. It wasn't metaphoric. It's not symbolic. The animal sacrifices were symbolic. How could a goat pay for my sins? The goat is stupid. The goat doesn't understand betrayal. The goat doesn't understand lust. The goat doesn't understand greed. The goat just eats grass. Jesus, the perfect sacrifice, literally wore our iniquity, our shame, our guilt. I can barely handle my own junk. Imagine handling the junk of billions of those he loves all at once to only have his father turn his face for the first time in all eternity. It was so terrifying it made Jesus sweat drops of blood. And for him to say yes to that and to scream the way he did tells you how terrible your sins are. The result of the cry. It says that when Jesus screamed, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, and then he asks for a drink. But here's the odd thing. They offer him something he refuses. He wanted water. They were giving him a narcotic. He's like, no, I'm meant to suffer. I won't drink it. Then he says, it's finished, and he dies. The moment he dies, the earth shakes. You know what's cool if you actually read uh, some archaeology, uh, if you actually read some science behind this, they found uh, a disturbance uh, in the sediments at the Dead Sea that matches up exactly with around 33 AD, a localized earthquake, exactly where Jesus died. The earth shook. And it says that the curtain in the temple split from top to bottom. Obviously, as the earth is shaking, the posts that hold the curtains kind of are not in balance. The curtain rips. Coincidence? No, because at the same time, some caves open and the dead come back to life. I don't have too much to say about that. It's mysterious. But I think what God is doing is alerting people that something extremely life-giving is happening. Between the tearing of the curtain and the resurrection of the dead, something cosmic is happening. What is happening? Why is suddenly the curtain ripping, the dead coming back to life? Here's what Jesus accomplished as he was abandoned. It says it very clearly in Hebrews 10, 19 through 22. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened up for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings. Eugene Peterson's message translation says it this way. So friends, we can now without hesitation walk right up to God, into the holy place. Jesus has cleared the way by the blood of his sacrifice, acting as a priest before God. The curtain into God's presence is his body. So let's do it, full of belief, confident, that we're presentable inside and out. 
Here's what the cry accomplished. It tore the barrier between us and God. His body being ripped apart, paralleled with the curtain ripping apart. Remember, that curtain is what separated us from the very presence of God. That curtain opened only once a year for the high priest on Yom Kippur. That curtain symbolized how God had to quarantine himself because we're evil and he is holy. But when Jesus uttered his final breath, it says the earth shook, the curtain tore, and Jesus made a way where there once was no way. You who are evil, you who are sinners, you who are imperfect, could not access God. But when Jesus died, he took your penalty, and he faced God's wrath so you don't have to. It says that action, what he committed there, it tore the curtain. So now you can walk confidently and boldly into God's presence. Jesus is forsaken, so I would never have to be. Jesus is abandoned, so I can be adopted. Jesus is rejected, so I can be accepted. Jesus suffers wrath, so I can receive grace. Jesus loses everything, so I can gain every blessing in heaven. Jesus wears the crown of thorns, so I can have a crown of beauty. Jesus wears my sins on his shoulders, so I can have a garment of praise draped over mine. Jesus is humiliated, so I can be exalted. Jesus dies, so I can live. Thanks be to God. I don't get it, though. I don't get the calculus. I don't get the exchange. I don't get why he drank the cup for me. I'm not all that valuable. If you'd like to disagree, think, well, no, I'm all that. I deserve to be saved. I'll tell you point blank, I would never sacrifice my child for you. Never. So why would God sacrifice his son for you? The Good Friday is not a testament to your worth, although you're worth a lot. That's not the focus. That cross is a testament to his love. Because we are sinners deserving of hell. If you disagree with me, take it up with your Bible. We're facing wrath and condemnation. But here is the Son of God who takes your place. That you may have life. Our sins were that bad. But the cross has the final word. His love is stronger. His love is stronger. So he says in Hebrews 10, the author in Hebrews 10 says, so friends, we can come now without hesitation, walk right up to God, into the holy place. Jesus has cleared the way by the blood of his sacrifice, acting as our priest before God. The curtain into God's presence is his body. Let's do it full of belief, confident that we're present, we're presentable inside and out. And then Hebrews 4.16, now that we know what we have, Jesus, this great high priest with ready access to God, let's not let it slip through our fingers. We don't have a priest who's out of touch with our reality. He's been through weakness and testing, experienced it all, all but this, all but the sin. So let's walk right up to him and get what... He, he is so ready to give. Take the mercy, accept the help. So Jesus, through his forsakenness, rips open the curtain, welcomes us to come right up to God and experience this incredible love. And the best way to dignify this cross is to take that invitation up. It came at a very high cost. It's to come confidently to God Receive the help you need. And so tonight, if I can have the worship team come back up. And if I can have the cross back at the center. Uh, 
I'm going to lead us to communion. But I want to do it a little differently today. In your seat back, you have an index card and a pen. I wanted you to take a moment as the worship team sings, um, the cross has the final word over us. What tonight separates you from God? What holds you back? What creates distance between you and the Father? Maybe there's things you feel shame about, guilt, regret. And tonight you have an opportunity to let the cross have the final word over it. What you write on that card does not have the final word. This cross does. And so I want you to come and exchange those burdens for this incredible gift of love. You're going to come, and after you've written something in that car, you're going to come, you can fold it, and you're just going to literally take it to the cross. It might take a little muscle, but it'll work. And then you'll come and receive the elements in exchange. And you can leave that burden here. You don't have to take it home. Endless forgiveness. Endless mercy. Acceptance. Love. We don't deserve it. It doesn't make any sense. But this is the love of God. So as they sing over us, take a moment. Write down what you feel like is pulling you away from God, what you feel like is separating you from God, what you feel like is static between you and God. Something you want to leave here tonight on the cross of Jesus. And after you do, come and receive the elements. And the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and broke it. He said, whenever you do this, do this remembrance of me. In the same way he took the cup, which is the blood of his covenant. When we drink this, do this in remembrance of me. Lord, we come to your cross. We thank you that we can leave behind our sins, our guilt, our shame. You already drank it down, so we don't have to. And instead, you give us your wine, your body, your blood, your body your life. We thank you for this ridiculous, unfair exchange on our behalf. We worship you and thank you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Let's stand together. And as the Spirit leads, just come. Um, or you can worship and then receive the elements.
stand together and sing this. Oh 
this visual here, this visual of this cross covered with all our shame, all our guilt, it's a very powerful one because you get a small glimpse of what Jesus was facing. All our junk on him, all our guilt on him, all our condemnation. Jesus drank down the cup of God's wrath for our sake because he loves us. He chose it. Thank you, Jesus. Can you just confess in your heart how much you thank him, how much you love him for choosing to do this for us? Now there's no more condemnation. There's no more guilt. Amen. Amen. He's taking it all. We just get to receive his mercy and grace because he took our condemnation. Let's take a moment and thank our Lord. Jesus, we thank you. We honor you. We love you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We can't even understand this love. We can't understand why you do it. It's an incomprehensible love why you would choose to take this on. But because you did, we're on the receiving end of grace, of mercy, of forgiveness, of love eternal. And we thank you, Jesus. A part of uh, the, the benefits and blessings of the cross is healing. I'm going to ask Pastor Raul to close us out by praying healing over us and inviting us into uh, the healing of the cross. So go ahead, Pastor Raul. Scripture speaks of the early church and says that everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miracles and signs were done by the apostles. Why is this possible? Because of what Pastor Dion uh, had shared earlier, referencing Isaiah 53. Just to remind us, it says this. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering, like one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, and he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. The healing that's spoken of here is one of, it's a holistic healing. Every part of you made whole. Your physical body, your mental, emotional well-being made whole in Christ because of his great sacrifice for you. And so we believe, as the New Testament church believed, the early New Testament church believed that we can apportion what Christ did at the cross now for us, for our healing. And so I believe the same Spirit of God that lives in me lives in you if you call yourself a, a, a son or daughter of God and you put your faith in who Christ is and what He has done on the cross for us. And so it would make perfect sense that we should do as the early church did, lay hands on one another and trust God for healing. And so what we would like to do is in this moment, if, if you yourself need healing, whether that's physical, mental, emotional health, healing, or you are representing someone that needs a breakthrough in that type of way, we'd like you to just simply acknowledge that by raising your hand saying, I, I need healing, or I'm praying for someone who needs healing. If that's you, or you're praying for someone else, would you raise your hand? And with those of you that are followers of Jesus around those who have their hands raised, would you turn towards them and come around them? And if it is all right for those of you that have your hands raised, if those folks who come around you could put their hands on, their, on your shoulder or on your back, if that would be okay. We're going to trust in this moment that what Scripture says is true, that by His wounds, we are healed. We are healed. And so I'd like you to just say that in your mind right now. By His wounds, we are healed. Say that a couple times in your own mind. Say that a couple times. By His wounds, we are healed. 
And now those of you that are laying hands on those with their hands raised, would you say that out loud? Would you say, by His wounds we are healed. By His wounds we are healed. Just meditate on that for a moment as you pray for that person. Now I'd prompt you to just pray for that person. Pray for God's healing. Pray for them now. Extend your faith and pray for them to be healed. And I'll come back and pray for us in a moment. Lord, we thank You that at the cross You bore wounds and stripes for our healing from cancer. You bore our wounds. You bore wounds and stripes for our healing of anxiety, of depression, of suicidal ideation, of chronic illness. Lord, of any, anything that could be spoken of that if infirms our bodies and our minds. Lord, You were slayed for those things. And so, Lord, we say yes and amen to what the Scriptures say, that we can lay hands on one another as, as the family of God, and we can see restoration and healing come. So, Lord, we ask that You would heal those that need healing. Their physical body, their, their emotional body, their mental body. Lord, would You Heal them now in Jesus' name. By the power of God, made available to us by our good and loving Savior who takes all of it upon Himself and then gives us the ability to enjoy what He has enjoyed forever. Perfect union with Him, with the Father. Perfect health. Perfect wholeness. We pray that over each other and for each other. And for those that aren't here that we're praying for, we lift them up to you now, God. We pray that you would do a miracle, that you would heal in Jesus' name. And we thank you, God, that in, in the time between the moment now that we pray and the moment when healing comes, would you give us faith? Would you give us endurance? Would you give us an ability to believe, to believe you in Jesus' name? In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you for praying, church. Check, check. Thank you for coming out tonight. We're so glad you guys can spend our first Good Friday together. We look forward to Easter. I know it's raining. It's going to rain. Jesus will still resurrect on Easter. Amen. He's still risen even though it rains. Um, there's no egg hunt tomorrow because of the rain, but we're going to love on your kids Easter morning. You bring your kids to our Easter services, 8 o'clock, 9.30, and 11. Be blessed. Have a great night tonight.